Gates, hosted by the hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. This series and new museum exhibits to open over the next two summers commemorate the 150th birthday of Yellowstone, our world's first national park. My name is Diane Chalfant, and I'm a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. Our museum is a tremendous resource for our community, and so much of it can be accessed online. Beyond these webinar programs, the Yellowstone Gateway Museum also offers a fascinating digital photo archives, online exhibits, and research services. So if you're not currently a member, we encourage you to become a member and explore more about the rich natural and cultural heritage of Park County, Montana. In a moment, I'll introduce the museum's curator, Karen Reinhart. But first, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you'll know how to participate in tonight's program. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of our presenter, Ruth Quinn. Your questions will be anonymous. And to submit a question, just type your question in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, the control panel there. And Karen and I will read the questions and share them with our speaker. As time allows, Ruth will address as many questions as she can during the presentation. We are recording the webinar and we'll upload it to Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel after the event. And then you'll be able to go back to that YouTube channel, watch the program over, or uh, you know, invite your friends to come watch the program and or any of the other fascinating programs that we've had that are now on the YouTube channel that we've done over the last couple of years. And finally, following the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to take a very brief survey. And we hope you will take that survey because it helps us improve this webinar series and other programs of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. Well, I'd like to now introduce Yellowstone Gateway Museum's curator, Karen Reinhardt. Karen? Thank you, Diane. We're very excited to offer this Yellowstone Focus Program Series this, this spring to help celebrate the park's 150th anniversary. So, Please um, enjoy this program, but also register for the other upcoming programs, which include next Wednesday, April 13th, archeologist and author Douglas McDonald presents Before Yellowstone, Native American Archeology span in the National Park. Native people have hunted bison and bighorn sheep, fished for cutthroat trout and gathered bit bitterroot and camas bulbs in the park for at least 11,000 years. McDonald tells the story of early people in the park as revealed by his and students' research of nearly 2,000 sites. And then on April 20th, Lisa Morgan, U.S. Geological Survey scientist, presents the dynamic floor of Yellowstone Lake, the last 14,000 years of hydrothermal explosions, venting, doming, and faulting. Lisa has worked in the park for 42 years and shares very interesting findings about the largest high elevation hell of high elevation lake in North America. The final program is April 27, presented by Katie Christensen, editor of the Artists Field Guide to, to Yellowstone. She collaborated with 50 local artists and writers who paired up to reveal new ways of understanding the park's key species. Artist Jenny Lowe Anker and DJ House, as well as writers Elise Atchison, Todd Burrett, and myself will also participate. And now what you've been waiting for, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Ruth Quinn. She has spent 32 summers in the park's interior, including 25 years giving awesome tours of the Old Faithful Inn. She is a certified interpretive guide with the National Association for Interpretation. In the winter, Ruth works for Gardner Human Resources, helping hire staff for Zantara's nine lodging facilities. She is the author of Weaver of Dreams, The Life and Architecture, of Robert C. Reamer and co-author of Horses, Hotels, and Hospitality, Harry W. Child's epic vision for Yellowstone Park. While working at her first Yellowstone job at the Lake Hotel front desk, she met her husband, Leslie Quinn. Together, they research and share the history of tourism in Yellowstone and are proud to be part of welcoming visitors to the park's wonders. Ruth grew up in Kansas and graduated from Bethany College and the University of Kansas. Although she's never watched an episode of the hit TV show Yellowstone, 
She enjoys hiking, collecting Yellowstone fiction, and searching for Yellowstone references in movies and TV shows. Please welcome Ruth Quinn. Thank you, Karen and Diane. I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to begin to share my screen here. We have put together a, a program this evening, PowerPoint type program. And I'm including my co-author's name, Nan Segrist as well. She has chosen not to um, participate in our um, video portion this evening, but I hope is listening along and we'll certainly be watching this with her at a later date. Um, she got this um, program or this research project, I guess, started with me and I'm kind of happy to share that with you a little bit here today. I can get things moving here. Going on to my next slide here. There we go. All right. So Yellowstone's human history um, is not one story, but many stories. And I think I may stop my, feel like my video is getting in the way or, of my uh, pictures here. Just going to turn that off a little bit, if I may. Um, you know, Yellowstone's lots of stories, and some of those stories we're listening to a little bit more keenly right now. I'm uh, aware that we're um, listening to a few more Indigenous stories this summer. I'm very excited about that. Some stories are still waiting to be told, um, but the story of Yellowstone that I belong to is the story of the hotels and transportation, how they came to be and how they have evolved over time. For the past 150 years of the park's history, hospitality has been as important as the wild natural resources of Yellowstone. And I have been fortunate to see the story of hospitality from two sides, one as an employee of the concessionaire hotel company, and also as one who's been involved in hiring these employees. Nan Segrist, my co-author, her late husband and two of their children and other various family members have logged over 100 years as concession employees. My husband and myself are over 75 years combined. We're among the employees who form a strong connection to Yellowstone's tradition of service. Rather than starting at the beginning, Nan and I chose to tell the story of one family's impact on hospitality in Yellowstone. This family built the foundation and nourish the roots of hospitality from 1892 to 1966. I have to move away from Yellowstone to begin the story. Actually begins for us in Helena, Montana, where this man, Silas Huntley, um, coming after the Civil War, as many soldiers did coming west, um, established himself in Helena um, with a horse operation, running stagecoaches from the um, steamboat end, at the end of the steamboat line at Fort Benton um, to Helena, bringing goods and got mail contracts to run uh, mail and freight um, between those two places. Also was involved in some road building in Helena and ultimately um, joined with another gentleman by the name of Clark to operate the Riverside Stock Farm. Here's a, a woodcut of their stock farm, which was south of Helena near Tostin, Montana. And um, the Riverside Stock Farm in this woodcut, you can actually see on the left-hand side their racetrack because they also got very involved in horse racing for a very early time here in Montana history. And with Silas Huntley joined two other men that came from a different direction. Silas Huntley himself was coming from the Midwest, but Harry Child and Edmund Bach 
came from California um, together as brass young men. Um, and they are ending up coming, becoming partners with Silas Huntley in several business interests, both in Helena and ultimately in Yellowstone Park. I'll get to Yellowstone in just a few minutes. Bear with me here. A few more minutes here in Helena. They actually came um, together as buddies um, to visit Harry's uncle, W.C. Child, who was a part owner of the Gregory Mine. Um, this mine was um, northwest of Helena. Very quickly, Mr. Bach ended up involving himself in mercantile, opening general stores at a couple of different mines, as well as a big storefront in downtown Helena, while Harry involved himself um, becoming manager of two mines, not only the Gregory, but also the Gloucester mine near Marysville, Montana. Now entering the picture, not only these three gentlemen, but also a few ladies coming into our picture as well. Three sisters, Annie Dean, Mariah Dean, and Adelaide Dean, who also all ended up in Helena coming from Wisconsin. Annie, the oldest of these three girls, um, spent some of her young adult years, I guess you could say, um, in Washington, D.C., being part of the social scene there. That's where she met Silas Huntley, who was back in Washington um, lobbying to get mail contracts. Um, they started a romance and ended up marrying in 1879, and Annie came to um, the ranch outside of Helena um, to live there with Silas, and ultimately her two sisters would come and visit her as well, Adelaide arriving first, and then Mariah um, finishing medical school studies and ultimately joining her two sisters in Helena as well. One of the stories that Adelaide tells is how the young gentlemen in Helena um, like to bring their horses and buggies down to the train station to watch all the newcomers checking out any young ladies that might be getting off the train. And Adelaide was one of those young ladies uh, that Harry Child took a shine to. And one of their courtship stories was walking down Last Chance, Last Chance Gulch in Helena um, to the fire tower, also pictured here, um, part of their early romance. And the um, Silas Huntleys and the Harry Childs, um, Harry and Adelaide ultimately married um, and had two children um, very early in their marriage as well. And those two families, since the sisters were very close to one another, um, they ended up um, taking a fine home in, on Madison Avenue. Um, the three homes pictured there from the left were the home of um, Samuel Hauser, a territorial governor, A.J. Seligman, who was also involved, uh, involved in mining and um, the territory of government as well, and then the Huntleys and the Childs lived in the house that's closest to us in that picture. Um, those are all standing, by the way, in Helena there on Madison Avenue. Um, Harry also got involved, um, besides his mining interests, um, got involved in agriculture as well, purchasing some land also near Silas Huntley's land and um, was um, raising cattle and also farming and raising racehorses as well and breeding racehorses. Also got into real estate in Helena. Um, this particular property um, known as um, Orofino Terrace was an apartment type building, actually had three different um, residences under one roof. And over the years, many various family members um, lived in this home, including Harry and Adelaide and their children at very various times throughout um, their um, time in, the, in, in Helena. Um, about 1889, Harry was invited to develop a silver smelter at Great Falls. So although maintaining a residence in Helena, he began um, commuting up to oversee the construction of this large facility um, and including this very beautiful home um, that was constructed and he was acting as the manager for this um, operation. He himself un only ended up staying there for about two years, but still um, referred to himself as a miner. 
It was Silas Huntley who first entered into Yellowstone, um, gaining control of the transportation company in 1892. Um, this allowed him to uh, continue his horse-drawn life for a few more years, even though automobiles were starting to be seen around the area. Um, Huntley, uh, Silas Huntley was able to um, bring his operation and his horses into Yellowstone to begin that um, transportation um, operation here. He was especially well known for how well cared his equipment was. Interior of his um, painting shed here at Mammoth Hot Springs. And he also began to um, occupy a small home that had been um, belonged to um, George Wakefield um, first, which um, the little home there, this actually this picture is all, th all three the same building as it evolved over time, it got bigger and bigger. Um, but ultimately um, it was um, this little cottage where Silas Huntley and Annie Huntley would come for the summer seasons. Um, that particular building, by the way, Lee Whittlesey has identified as being our oldest building in Yellowstone that is um, still an occupied building and occupied by hotel um, concession employees still. And at the age of nine, Harry and Adelaide's son, whose name was Huntley Child, named after their good friend Silas Huntley, he began to come and spend his summers in Yellowstone and became to, began, began to learn that horse operation um, from the inside. So it was these three men, although Silas was considered to be the man on the ground, if you will, it was these three men who were financing the operation and ultimately um, driving its um, success here in Yellowstone. Um, Harry and um, Bach were both called upon at different times to escort um, dignitaries who would come into the park. Um, Bach became known as Major Bach from his time in the volunteers during the Spanish-American War. And there were often notations um, we found in newspapers and documents about people he was escorting around Yellowstone. And Harry was also often called upon to do some of these escorting um, visitors, even though he may not have been at first involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, one of his very early um, people he ended up um, meeting here and escorting around was President Theodore Roosevelt, who visited the park in 1903, and especially um, was taken around um, the president in a winter adventure out to um, the canyon area and the Old Faithful area. Harry Child is in the back right of the sleigh there. Um, it is his um, main freight man, Joe DeBar, at the reins there, the president in the front, and accompanying the president was John Burroughs. Um, <laughs> so that's Harry in the big coat there on the right. And these two men ended up becoming good friends, and the family has um, some gifts that were exchanged and some letters that were exchanged between the two men over time. Um, when Roosevelt visited Helena again in 1911, Harry was on hand um, to drive him um, and escorting him around the town. Harry's little head is sticking up there in the middle of the, the, drive, in the, middle of the car in that particular photo there. About 1901, um, that's when Harry and Edmund Bach and Silas Huntley ended up moving into the hotel company. Um, already operating hotels throughout Yellowstone um, with the financial help from the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, they um, set plans to begin obtaining the hotel contract as well as the transportation contract. Um, Harry himself had a house built for his family at Mammoth Hot Springs. This is another hotel that, or another um, structure that related to the family that is still standing in Yellowstone at the base of the terraces there at Mammoth Hot Springs. And at about the age of 15, Huntley Child, keeping all our Huntley straight here, 
um, the son of Adelaide and Harry Child actually began working for Hiram Chittenden in the summers, um, working on road crews in their road building projects, especially um, talking about working along the shore of Yellowstone Lake and that portion of the road system. Um, back when Harry and Adelaide finished their project in Great Falls, they started a tradition in the family that would continue for the rest of their lives. And that was to spend their winters or portions of their winters in San Diego. Early in um, their visit, which is where Harry Child met Robert Reamer, the man in the middle here, who would ultimately come to Yellowstone and be involved in assisting Harry in improving the hotel situation in Yellowstone. Hotels already operating in the park when Harry and Silas got involved. Um, in fact, Silas died the same year all of that was happening. Um, they gained the hotel contract. Um, Silas died in September of 1901, um, but Harry himself continued to um, operate um, with Mr. Bach behind him as well for a few years. Um, Robert Reamer's first project in Yellowstone was Old Faithful Inn, which I think many of us are familiar with. Um, that was a, a year-long construction to get this building open in 1904. And here is a little statement from Olin Wheeler in Wonderland, which was a Northern Pacific Railroad brochure referring to Old Faithful Inn saying, truly, it is truly as much a product of the park as is the noble geyser from which it derives its name. At the same time, Adelaide Child was involved in picking out furniture and furnishings for um, these new um, renovated hotels and new hotels that were being constructed. I have a couple of uh, comparison shots from um, old catalogs as well as current furniture that we still find around Old Faithful Inn today. So she also was very involved in that. And in many off seasons, we found that Harry and Adelaide would go to furniture shows um, during their um, time between seasons and purchase furniture and furnishings um, for the different hotels. I think very much this is where the whole foundation of that Yellowstone hospitality um, came into being some early employees there and the Old Faithful Inn's first manager, Larry Matthews. At the same time Reamer was building Old Faithful Inn, he was also um, taking Lake Hotel um, from a very plain 1891 structure to something a little bit fancier today, um, bringing the colonial look to that particular structure. Adelaide again, um, giving her um, artistic hand to furniture and furnishings. Um, Robert Reamer also designed uh, another home for the child family here at the base of Capitol Hill at Mammoth Hot Springs. Um, this sits uh, across the flat from um, the Mammoth Hotel, for those of you familiar with that area. And um, th at this time, um, their children, Ellen, Dean Child, and Huntley Child were getting old enough that they were establishing families of their own. So in fact, um, Huntley Child and his family ended up moving into um, the Colonial House, and then this house at Mammoth became um, Adelaide and Harry's home um, for many years as they continued to operate here within the park. They also had an interest in developing a new hotel for the Canyon area. And in 1909, they invited Robert Reamer to accompany them to Europe to look at some of the architecture in Europe. And what ended up um, being added to Yellowstone's landscape was the Grand Canyon Hotel, constructed between 1910 and 1911, where the Canyon horse corrals are today in Yellowstone, just to place this in, um, the area, and this was a monumental winter construction, um, bringing tons and tons of freight from the railhead in Gardner up um, into the interior part of the park to complete this building for its opening in 1911. 
Unfortunately, this is one of the structures that is no longer in Yellowstone's landscape here. But I think very much with the completion of Old Faithful Inn and Canyon Hotel, man-made creations became the attraction and hospitality itself became as important as the wild resources of Yellowstone. Here's one thing that was printed and said about the Canyon Hotel, referring to the Great Lounge. This great loom, room alone is worth making the trip to Yellowstone to see. Also at the same time, Harry and Silas were involved in the transportation operation in Yellowstone. Um, there was always a question of handling the horses in the wintertime when they were not needed for um, transporting tourists around the park. Um, prior to Silas Huntley becoming involved with the transportation in the winter, horses were brought um, from Yellowstone up north into Paradise Valley and also toward um, the east from Paradise Valley along the Yellowstone River um, Valley. But Harry actually began acquiring property um, over on the other side, on the west side of the park, um, between the um, Gallatin Mountain Range and the Spanish, uh, or the <laughs> Madison Range, um, and developed what would ultimately become the Flying D um, ranch. You can see that um, that is their brand up in the upper um, left hand corner of the screen, which um, the family story is that the um, D is there for the Dean of the three sisters who joined the family and um, the rocking C um, on the other edge for the child portion of the family. So that's the flying D brand there. It is where the, the horses were taken over the Gallatin range uh, for the winter um, to stay on that land. And the um, business also um, developed into um, cattle as well. I believe this is a 1929 um, photograph taken of the horses. And uh, Nan especially um, very fondly remembers um, some one of the last roundups that was um, taking place um, on the Flying D Ranch when um, horse operations were changing in Yellowstone. Um, the family also um, constructed the Spanish Creek Ranch House that's visible from US Highway 191 um, heading into Gallatin Canyon um, from that um, part of the park uh, as well. And Harry and Charles Anthony, the other um, owner of the Flying D property, were very proud of um, their show animals. Um, this one being Ringmaster, who was a grand champion three different years in the 19 teens. And that's Charles Anthony on the left and Harry um, on the right there. Um, they also kept um, some connection to Helena all through the time, even though they were operationing in the park here, they still maintained a home and all contacts in Helena. Um, this is actually two pictures of the same home, almost a then and now, if you will, on Stewart Street in Helena, which was a home occupied by um, Harry's mother and Harry's sister and brother at different times. Many of his family, um, ultimately from um, back east, from Massachusetts and from California, all ended up moving to Helena over the course of lifetimes. Um, the eldest sister, Annie, also stayed involved in Helena. Um, she would, um, after Silas's death, travel um, a little bit more widely across the world and ultimately air, uh, married um, Samuel Marks Baldwin Young, um, or Samuel Baldwin Marks Young, sorry, um, who was twice a superintendent here in Yellowstone. See, Ruth, we had a question about the Spanish Creek House. Would you remind us where it, it is? Let's see. Yes, the Spanish Creek Ranch House. Um, I would say it is um, coming from Bozeman South. I think you passed the Spanish Creek Trailhead. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to think of exactly 
Um, what else is in that vicinity? There's a, so little, it's on cabin, there's a little cabin hotel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's closer to Bozeman, I would say. On 191. On 191, if Leslie will Great. help me out. Okay. I'd say it's a quarter mile off the road, but it is visible from the road. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to find some other landmarks in my head, but nothing coming to me there. Um, um, so just to kind of come back here, um, Annie um, would end up coming to spend a bit more time in the park. Um, she had met Young um, while he was acting superintendent of Yellowstone, 1891 to 1897. Um, that was the time when her husband Silas was very involved in the transportation here in the park. Um, lives went separate ways and ultimately Young would come back to Yellowstone, this time retired from the army and now full superintendent of Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. So he actually um, did two um, different stints as superintendent and ended up um, marrying um, Silas Huntley's widow, Annie, and they would establish themselves in Helena as well in a fine home picture there on the left. And Dr. Dean also ended up um, establishing her medical practice in, both in Helena, mostly focusing on um, children's health and women's health. Um, she, in fact, became the 27th um, doctor to receive a medical license when the state of Montana was um, made an official state and her um, former home is recognized on the woman's walking tour of Helena um, pictured right there as well. Um, the two children of Harry and Adelaide Child um, as they came of age ended up establishing their way in Yellowstone as well. I don't have a picture of young Ellen Dean Child, but I do have this picture of her husband, William Nichols, who came to Yellowstone with the army as well and ended up resigning his commission to uh, marry Ellen Dean Child. Um, Huntley Child ended up becoming, both of these men ended up becoming involved in the transportation and hotel um, developments in Yellowstone as well. And this is the home they occupied in Helena as well. So the family would often spend their summers in Yellowstone and their winters between Helena and um, Southern California. A familiar symbol to many of us working in um, Yellowstone today is this, um, what we sometimes refer to as the target bear, which began being used um, by Harry with the hotel company in 1905. And this was a photograph taken in the Fountain Hotel dump. And this postcard of um, one of Frank Haynes's postcard actually shows the um, trash <laughs> and the can still there. This ended up being uh, turned into uh, little trees and <laughs> little bits of vegetation you can see as it was used for the company. Um, operation here. Um, Nan and I had a lot of fun um, looking through um, the archives here in Gardner, where I'm speaking to you from, um, looking at old correspondence from the hotel and transportation company and finding a lot of these old letterheads. Um, I love that one at the top because it shows um, the movement from the Yellowstone Association, which is the name of the company that Harry ended up buying into as he is making the transition to calling at the Yellowstone Park Hotel Company. Um, he also, at this time period, early 1900s, um, is in full control of the Yellowstone Park Transportation Company as well. But over the next couple of years, a couple of major changes uh, operationally are going to come into um, Harry's life and challenging um, the two younger generation. Um, William Nichols um, ended up starting out as Harry's secretary and later became his assistant. 
while Huntley Child became involved more in the transportation side of things since he had been involved in transportation. But in 1915, pulled into Yellowstone. And I love this picture because it does show the stagecoach still in use, but hiding there in the background, a um, car driving down the road as well. And it was actually um, the Haynes operation running out of West Yellowstone, which started as the Manita and Yellowstone Stage Company and ultimately came Yellowstone Western Stage Company that first began um, a little bit publicly announcing that they were attempting to switch to, to automobiles. And we found this notation in a 1903 newspaper that they had visited several different manufacturing concerns that turn out autos. There they learned that the largest motors that were capable of carrying no more than six persons, even with a small number, they must be packed so close as to be uncomfortable while no room is left for baggage without which the five days trip cannot be made. So they were finding out in 1903 that the automobiles were not quite ready to replace the stagecoaches in Yellowstone. 1916, the stagecoaches were still operating in the park, but the first um, wheeled motor company was also starting from the east side of the park, the Cody Sylvan Pass Motor Company. And it was Frank Haynes who was the major um, operator of this. But if you look at that letterhead, you'll see a couple familiar names there. Um, W.M. Nichols and Huntley Child, both um, representing the Yellowstone Park Transportation Company, as well as Huntley Child serving as the treasurer and one of the officers in this company. Now, this particular photograph taken at Sylvan Lake um, these coaches basically were running from the train depot in Cody to Pahaska Teepee to Yellowstone Lake, where they got off at the Lake Yellowstone Hotel and got onto the stagecoaches through the park. Um, that operation just ended up lasting for one year because of some other changes that were coming down um, into the operational changes of Yellowstone, which was the uh, establishment of the National Park Service in 1916. Um, Stephen Mather being the driving force between getting that organiza organization established and Horace Albright um, becoming the first superintendent of Yellowstone under the National Park Service. Prior to that, Army superintendents were um, operational within Yellowstone. Um, but with Stephen Mather and Horace Albright, it meant that after many years of doing business in Yellowstone with only answering to the Secretary of the Interior, Harry Child now had a whole lot more people telling him what to do, if you will. One of the third, first things that ended up happening with that operation was um, what Mather referred to as a control monopoly. He basically announced to all the concessionaires that rather than having many small camping companies and many transportation companies and perhaps many different people operating hotels in the park, there would be one lodging and camping company, one transportation company, and one hotel company, making it easier for the government to oversee all these operations. So Harry was awarded the um, transportation company, which meant he absorbed all of the equipment from the Cody Sylvan Pass line. And that became the base of his um, fleet and also the camps company um, consolidating as well. I'm not gonna go too much into detail. There's been a lot written about some of those things. But in the 1920s, Harry spent a lot of time promoting automobiles, um, a little brochure um, we found in the Montana Historical Society was his Geysers to Glaciers tour that he was promoting, uh, making a trip from um, between those two parks and with a stop overnight at Helena at the um, Broadwater Hotel there. Harry, definitely very fond of automobiles. I decided to throw up on this um, page Harry's um, garage that he asked Robert Reamer to build here in Gardner. 
And that's where he kept his automobiles before automobiles were permitted in the park. He would take his automobiles back and forth to Helena, but he had to leave them in Gardner and take a horse-drawn vehicle up to the home in Mammoth. Um, this is actually Harry with Walter White. Um, most of the vehicle purchases early were coming from um, the White Motor Company in Cleveland, Ohio. And there was a lot of press being made about the arrival of these vehicles in Yellowstone. And um, some of you might have heard about um, Stephen Mather being involved in um, a multi-day um, park to park highway um, kind of a project where he was attempting to improve highways to connect national parks to one another. And that's actually some traveling um, that Harry did the year before um, Stephen Mather's very publicized trip actually promoting in newspapers about this whole idea of visiting the national parks and connecting them. Um, many of us love the day that, um, oops, getting an unstable note on my internet. Am I still on board here? Looks like I'm still sharing. <laughs> Please let me know if I'm not. I got a little message that maybe my internet was becoming unstable. You're still sharing, it looks good. Still good? Okay, yep. thank you, Diane. And this, by the way, is the large building in Gardner, um, which was built to house the fleet. Um, some of the um, Christmas cards that were produced by the transportation company discussed how they had one car for every day of the year. <laughs> and that's kind of a close up of um, that target bear on the front of that transportation company building. Um, toward the end of Harry's active life in Yellowstone, he became very interested in a second um, operation um, with um, agricultural. Um, this was the Green Meadow Farm, which was north of Helena. Um, and this was a project also involving Robert Reamer to bring him um, and his artistic um, talents into um, building a first-class farm in this area. Very famous, um, local, well-known um, barn um, that did end up succumbing to fire. Um, I was able to visit this property um, 20 years ago or so, and there were still a couple of buildings, the bunkhouse and the granary and the blacksmith shop still standing as a part of that operation. Um, but Harry from both the Flying D Ranch and the Green Meadow Ranch was actually supplying a lot of the food goods that were coming into the park. Um, the Flying D had the beef contract for many, many years. And then um, you can see from that letterhead that the um, Green Meadow Farm was also growing a lot of um, um, products there as well that were being transported into the park. Harry himself died in 1931. Newspaper headline from the Livingston Enterprise there, pages and pages of different tributes um, given to him. And I believe it was uh, grandson, um, Jock Nichols, who supplied the scrapbook that this picture came out. Um, the son, Huntley Child had three children and Ellen Dean Child and William Nichols also had three children and those are the six grandkids sitting with Harry. <laughs> kind of a fun little picture there. Um, William Nichols continued for many years um, keeping these companies running within the park. In 1936, um, he created a merger of all of the operations and began calling it the Yellowstone Park Company. And this continued in family ownership until 1965. Um, Huntley Child himself actually did, um, I guess the easiest way to say, run afoul when the National Park Service um, came into the park. And he also, um, World War I was um, underway and he was choosing to um, enlist and join the war effort. And, um, this caused some contention between 
Boris Albright and him, um, Stephen Mather and himself, um, which led to his dismissal from the park company. Um, but William Nichols and Ellen Dean Nichols also continued and their children and the children of Huntley Child would end up coming back as well. Um, big operations after Harry was no longer um, involved in the company after his death, um, major transportation purchases of buses that get to look a little bit more familiar to us. I think very much from Silas Huntley's meticulous care of his equipment to Harry Child's very efficient management all the way to present time when many historic vehicles are in Gardner in the National Park Service's um, vehicle collection considered to be um, 30 vehicles, one of the largest vehicle collections of the National Park Service. Again, like the hotels, Yellowstone's transportation history has become an attraction in itself um, and therefore has become as important as any of the wild natural resources as of Yellowstone. As one current driver of this vehicle says, anytime I drive one of these, I feel like a rock star. So those transportation vehicles like the hotels have become a part of Yellowstone's landscape and part of that um, history. Also under William Nichols and other descendants of the family, we would see improvements to the Mammoth Hotel area. And this was Robert Reamer's last project for us here in Yellowstone, was the construction of our current Mammoth Hot Springs Hotel. Now, Adelaide remained active in the company, and it was her suggestion to create this large map of the United States made with different types of wood from all over the world. And she and Robert Reamer and William Nichols uh, communicated to um, create this beautiful piece of artwork that still remains in the Mammoth Hotel, has recently been restored by the National Park Service. Um, this um, family item is the sample that Reamer was creating. Um, one of the ideas they abandoned was to actually put the states of the flags in there instead of the names of the states and they ended up um, going away from that particular idea but um, that's one of the beautiful contributions um, this would have been also after prohibition time um, after 20 years of having no alcohol sales in the park um, william nichols was also involved in communicating with reamer um, to construct a, a new bar room for the old faithful inn called the bear pit lounge uh, another part of our beloved uh, hotel history is these bear pit panels. Um, there are five of these wooden panels still in use in the Bear Pod Deli in the Old Faithful Inn, as well as another set uh, constructed in glass in the um, wall that separates the present dining room from the present bear pit lounge as well. Ellen Child, or Ellen Child um, Nichols, I should say, in the upper picture there, um, spending her last years on the board of directors of the hotel company as the younger generation um, becomes more involved in all of that. I think the fact that this company continued into the second and the third generations um, weathering economic ups and downs, national emergencies, drastic changes in park management, and through it all, keeping up a tradition of service established by Silas Huntley and Harry and Adelaide Child attest to that idea that hospitality is having become as important as the wild natural resources in Yellowstone. Also during this time period when the younger generation was here, um, we saw the construction of the Canyon Lodge as we know it today, um, replacing the Canyon Hotel, which burned August 8th of 1960. Um, plans to replace it with the lodge were already underway when that event happened as well. So just a few of the things the family has been involved with over time. Grandson Huntley Child Jr. was on the board of directors um, when the hotel, when the family sold um, the company. 
as well as um, Grant and Johnny Nichols being involved in that as well. And Nan arrived herself, my co-author in Yellowstone, 1953. She was still hearing stories about grandmother, child, and old Harry. What he would think of this decision or what she would like about this particular thing. Now, lots of parts of this story have been told from different perspectives, and we relied heavily on the work of other authors, including Harry Child II, who has written his own family history, as well as um, Bruce Austin, having written about the transportation history and our buses in Yellowstone, Mark Berenger writing a lot about the uh, company from a business perspective, um, Phyllis Smith from Bozeman writing about the Flying D ranch lands, my own research about Robert Reamer. But for us, um, knowing that lots of the parts of the story have been told, our goal was to weave as many personal stories as we could um, in with Yellowstone tales and historical events. And I think we succeeded in doing this. And although early family members are gone, their influence is not gone. So here are a few places you might still be hearing um, the influence of Harry and Adelaide. Um, Adelaide very involved in um, making sure that Maddie Culver's grave was restored and maintained in the Firehole Picnic area. They um, gave the land to the Gardner Community Church um, to build here in the town of Gardner to get that project started in the early 1900s. If some of you have visited Yellowstone Lake and heard the Lake String Quartet, you might have heard them um, playing this tune of Jean Quaz called Yellowstone. And this was dedicated to William Nichols, as well as a piece of music, which I have never heard that was dedicated to Harry Child. I'll have to challenge the quartet to maybe figure out how to learn that one as well. Um, Ted's Montana Grill, on the venue here, right in the middle of the picture, a little tiny uh, notation there to Karen's Flying D Bison Chili. Um, the land that Harry and Charles Anthony developed together there um, has actually become the ranch that Ted Turner owns today, just to give you an idea of um, the scope of that influence. The Arch House here in Gardner that started out as Harry Child's Garage. Um, first became a general store, then became a private residence, later became our art gallery, uh, and now today is the art house operated by Yellowstone Forever. You can visit Giant Springs State Park in Great Falls, Montana, and walk around the um, hot spring that's there, as well as the remnants of the um, silver smelter that Harry built and several interpretive signs and a little trail walking around there. Some of those historic homes remaining in Helena as well. Mariah Dean has a wing of the hospital in Helena um, named to honor her and her work with women and children and promoting um, positive medical care in um, Helena. And their mother, of these three women. Um, Ellen Dean was very involved in the Unitarian Church in Helena, which ended up um, giving their um, one of their early buildings to become a library and ultimately the Grand Street Theater. And there still is a plaque um, on the building in memory of Ellen Dean. Adelaide being involved in um, also um, purchasing a stained glass win window in that building as a memorial to um, one of the early minister's wives. And of course we have in our landscape, um, these wonderful hotels, um, Lake Yellowstone Hotel and Old Faithful Inn, um, what they stand for here in Yellowstone and the impacts in architecture they have had as well. Now, when Nan started working here, she worked for the Yellowstone Park Company I myself came in the days of TW Recreational Services, and I've seen the transition through Amfac Parks and Resorts to Zantera Travel Collection. Um, and it's sad that some of these family names have been lost to history. In fact, I pulled these few words out of our current employee handbook, 
And you can see that Vantera a little bit more has chosen to embrace the Fred Harvey history and his role in Grand Canyon hospitality. So Nan and I have really enjoyed trying to bring our Yellowstone history to this a little bit more. Last year, I was asked to write about one specific dormitory at Old Faithful designed by Robert Reamer, built in 1920, 1922. The Old Faithful Women's Dormitory has now passed from concessions land assignment to National Park Service control. And considering this one building of 73 rooms, having served for approximately 100 years, considering two people per room, that means that over time, 15,000 seasonal employees have called this home. And I think the biggest place this family's influence is still felt is among the employees. This is truly our love story. These are statements that I took out of applications that came into Yellowstone this summer. People who say I have visited national parks and love them and I want to share them with others. To me, the fact that candidates reveal this attitude convinces me that through the past 150 years, hospitality is as important as the wild natural resources of Yellowstone. Nan and I are pleased for your interest tonight and happy to be able to share our passion with all of you. Thank you, Ruth. That was fascinating. I want to be sure that um, our viewers can um, know they can ask questions by just putting um, a note in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll uh, go ahead and, and um, read those questions to Ruth. But what a great presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ruth. I enjoyed that very much and learned some things that I didn't know. Um, it's very impressive to see the, the, the long reach that the family, the Harry Child family and extended family has had in the park. And there's still so many things that you can see and touch that they built. And I, I just kind of gives me goosebumps. Mm -hmm. um, I thought of one question for myself while others are thinking of, of their questions. Um, you've done a lot of research, of very interesting people. Uh, during your career. And I just wondered if there were an individual or two that you feel particularly close to. <laughs> well, certainly Robert Reamer, that was, you know, my research for 10 years doing tours of Old Faithful and got me interested in his life and his work. Um, a, a lot of things unknown that I was able to find and um, just was able to put that whole story together. Um, so yeah, I would say that's my, my very early connection. Mm -hmm. You know, Ruth, one of the things that you mentioned in a couple, in a couple of different ways in your presentation that I was fascinated by and hadn't really thought about was sort of the, the army and soldier histories and in, in intersecting with the hospitality um, history through marriages in the park and how, you know, Superintendent Young married Silas um, Huntley's widow um, and, and um, you know, just things that I hadn't really thought about how, you know, what the, what the time was like, the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s in the park and how these soldiers were there and there were, you know, employees of the hotels and so forth and just um, pretty, pretty neat to think about that time period. Well, I think especially in the winter when they were they they were the community and they were socializing together. And so yeah, that, right. that, that was who was there. Yeah. So yeah. Um, somebody is asking Chet Huntley was from Montana. Um, do you know if he was related to, to Silas Huntley? I have not found any connections from to Chet Huntley myself. Yeah, Silas and Annie had no children. Um, and to my knowledge, there was no other branches of the Huntley family that ended up in Montana, to my knowledge. And here's another question. Any significance to the red and blue circle around the bear? Red and blue circle around the bear. 
yeah patriotism was just kind of uh saying to me maybe just a red white and blue but i don't know mm -hmm. no, i've ne never found anything in writing about it or or anything passed down and ruth we, we want to let you know that you have um people who are saying hello to you on the on the q a <laughs> too and you'll be able to see those as well okay and thanking you for such a great program. Any other questions? I would like oh. to, um, is there another question, Diane? Yeah, let's see. Okay. Um, Go ahead. So about the change to cars and vehicles in the park system, what impact did this have on the environment? Were there road expansions immediately when they started using vehicles or was that much later? Yeah, the question about, um, I would say not road expansions, simply not immediate. Um, because the same roads were being used for, for many years, although surfaces were ultimately improved. Um, it certainly brought parking lots and campgrounds, you know, public auto camps was one of the first things the National Park Service started establishing with the automobiles um, coming into the park more. I don't know, Diane or, or Karen might have. Well, just kind of thinking about how that was well. early those early roads were those corduroy roads that the stagecoaches used, right? Mm -hmm. They were sort of the, um, the log roads, I guess. And then, as you said, they were covered over for vehicles. Yeah, and I don't think it was really till the 40s that pavement started being laid down around the park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the atomizing that. roads came a bit later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have another it's, question here is, and it is what happened to the Grand Canyon Hotel? I think she's referring yeah. to, you know, why, why was it, uh, yeah. why did it burn or why was it uh, going to be demolished, I guess. Before yeah, what, th this is actually one of our great stories from the family is that um, Huntley Child Jr. was on the board of directors um, of the hotel company when the decision was made to close the hotel. Um, this would have been 1958, and basically the ground on which it was built is clay, and for decades the building was sliding down the hillside, going sideways off its foundation. Um, I believe the way Huntley told it was that the, the plumbing was what was holding the building up, um, and so it, they decided to close it and demolish it. And during the demolition, um, it was an uh, unknown caused fire that um, ultimately destroyed the rest of the building. Part of the folklore. Um, and uh, one of our viewers has offered that the roads were paved in Yellowstone in 1936. Okay, thank you. Someone is asking what your favorite Yellowstone building is that you've seen and, um, and what's the one you wish you saw that is no <laughs> longer here? <laughs> Oh, I have to say Old Faithful Inn is my favorite <laughs> because I have spent so much time there, have so many memories there. Um, what has kept me interested giving tours there for so many years is just how people are interested in it from so many different angles. Um, you know, people who are railroad buffs or grand hotel buffs or interested in the furniture or interested in the carpentry. Um, you know, I always get interesting things I get to learn all the time about other things, even from a seven-year-old child who walked in and said, this remains, remain, reminds me of the Great Bear Lodge in Sandusky, Ohio. So oh my. I have to go check out the Great Bear Lodge in Sandusky, Ohio. 
so I can see what he means. Um, a well-trained child. <laughs> yes. Um, I have a day in history that I would go to the Canyon Hotel for its grand opening in August of 1911 because Harry Child was in the reception line, as was Robert Wiener. And I would like to thank both of those men for what they gave us. Nice. I agree with you, Ruth. Um, we have another question um, about A.W. Miles' connection to Yellowstone, and if you could speak to that. Wow. There's one of those stories that hasn't been told. <laughs> um, I believe there's a lot in, um, and the title is going to escape me right now, but the book about the um, camping, Wiley. Oh, yeah. Summers in Yellowstone. Yeah, sorry, the title is escaping me. Um, there, there is a whole um, book about the history of the Wiley um, Company and which ultimately um, A.W. A. Miles was involved in. And um, I believe it was he who um, obtained the company when um, Wiley himself retired and um, then was also involved with the, the Wiley company with the transportation and on from there. It, it's nothing I've spent a lot of time researching, but I think it is one of those stories that needs to be told. So I'm an someone amateur. Offers it, it I'm might an be amateur. Called, what's that? Someone offered, is it the book, The Wiley Way? No, I want to say it's Summers in Yellowstone. Hmm. Yeah, don't have it on the tip of my tongue. That's okay. Yeah, it. I, I edited that book, so um, <laughs> I can't remember the title, but it, it is a good it is a good book uh, about the Wiley uh, Camping Company. Uh -huh. cool. Yeah, very good. Um, and also just a, a little more information about A.W. Miles. Uh, we will be uh, interpreting his participation in the park in our new Yellowstone exhibit because, you know, he uh, was from Livingston and he was involved with the park on a lot of different levels. So, so look forward to that. Hopefully we'll flesh that out a little bit more. Um, and then we have another question, a follow-up to the Canyon Hotel question. Was there suspicion of foul, foul play in the fire that took the Canyon Hotel? And she said, question. would make a great movie. <laughs> yeah, the question about the, the foul play. Um, there's lots of conspiracy theories out there. Um, we do know that the company that purchased the hotel or had the contract to demolish the hotel, so money changed hands. They were able to salvage everything they could out of the hotel and their contract allowed them to burn it when they were finished. As long as they notified the park service when they were going to do that. Um, the cause of the fire still, I believe, is officially listed as unknown. Um, the building was not insured, so they weren't doing that. Um, I, I believe in the Yellowstone story, Aubrey Haynes um, posited that um, because the Yellowstone Park Company was investing so much money in developing Canyon Lodge um, and people weren't staying in the cabins, they burned the hotel down to force people into the cabins. Um, in fact, we in the park know that all hotels get sold out all the time. We could sell a whole lot more rooms if we had them, um, but that's kind of how, it, uh, you know, we, we who have been around a lot, ask a lot of questions. Um, we also have had former employees from that time indicate that that's where they went to party. So my suspicion is it was a combination of alcohol, cigarettes, and candles. No electricity in the building. But yeah. And if 
if nobody minds that I add something to that, um, I met somebody who has now passed away and she told me that she was told to, to go and set it on fire. And there were a group of young employees that did just that. And wow. I wish I could have interviewed her a little bit more about the details, but that's what she told me. Hmm. They wow. sort of were given permission to go make that happen. Hmm. Hmm. So, I don't know. So I love this next question. And it's a great question for Ruth, who has spent so much time in the Old Faithful Inn. And it isn't, this person is not asking about ghost stories. They want to know, are there any ghosts in Old Faithful Inn? Basically, ghosts in Old Faithful. <laughs> People who are sensitive to such things have had experiences there. I will leave it at that. <laughs> Um, I am not sensitive to such things myself. Okay. So I have not met any ghosts. But some people have, apparently. Okay. Any other questions? Well, Ruth, I guess it's, it's time to say good night. And I, I really want to thank you for a wonderful program. Very interesting. You had great questions as well. And um, I just really appreciate all of the, the time that you've spent researching and your wonderful program. So thank you. And we'll see hopefully everyone next week for our program on Wednesday night. Thanks, Ruth. Good night. Thank you. you. Good, Good night, night everybody. Good night.